Uh, but most of all, we're a very active and passionate community. We organize conferences. We organized five conferences the last two years, and we're currently organizing the Open Source CMS Summit, which will be hosted at Yahoo in Sunnyvale, and it takes place uh, in March, in about three or four weeks from now. There's also books written about Drupal. And most of all, we also make cakes and cookies <laughs> in the shape of the logo, which I think is a good sign for the fact that many of us are passionate about what we do and what we stand for. And so, to help support this community and to help um, Drupal grow and scale, um, we have a special announcement to make today. Um, you're the first to hear about this. So launching today, we are uh, launching a Drupal Association, which is a non-profit organization uh, meant to support Drupal. It will be based in Belgium. Um, but the board of directors and, and the people that make up the association will, uh, will be very international. Um, and the goal of the association will be to help the Drupal community succeed. And one of the things we'll be doing is continue organizing these conferences, um, making sure that the Drupal infrastructure will continue to scale and, and things like that. And the announcement or press release will go out tomorrow if you have more questions about this, you can contact us at association at Drupal.org. Uh, or you can uh, check out the website we made at association.drupal.org. There's all kinds of information about why we're doing this, who's involved, and the, the things we're going to take on. So, back to the main story. We also have lots of great users. A lot of community sites use Drupal. The Drupal website itself is based on Drupal. They also own KDE, Mozilla, Debian, and Ubuntu. have one or more uh, Drupal sites. It's not always their main site, of course, but there are various projects using Drupal. Um, universities tend to use Drupal. In Belgium, all the major universities have uh, one or more Drupal sites, but also uh, big universities in the States. Uh, broadcast companies are using Drupal in Belgium. PFT is using Drupal to build a YouTube clone. The, the main website of MTV UK is, uh, is built on Drupal and they're using Drupal uh, to make a MySpace clone. Um, BBC is using Drupal for a podcast site and so on. <coughs> you can also use Drupal on your internet. Uh, it doesn't have to be a public website. Like Yahoo and Skype uh, build part of their intranet on Drupal, <coughs> but also making institutions like uh, NASA, uh, NATO, the United Nations have one or more uh, Drupal sites, as you can see on the screenshots. <laughs> now, even Zatavini uses Drupal. For those who don't know Zatavini, it's, it's one of the biggest Belgian websites, and it's a, a shop block uh, kind of site. So. If you're Belgian, you probably know the site. Also, Rockstars use Drupal, this is the site of Moby, which in this site is entirely built on Drupal, this journal, uh, but also a collection or an overview of all these CDs and things like that. But most importantly, most of the Drupal sites are actually small and simple and often boring websites, like mine. <laughs> Um, that's really the cool thing about, about Drupal, that it's really accessible to so many people. And the fact that it's empowering so many people to build simple websites. Um, for example, the other day I, I, I bumped into a website which was created by a school teacher to build, um, you know, to build a site for his students. And that's, to me, that's really a lot more important than all the big sites I just mentioned before. So the mission really is that we're building technology to allow everyone uh, to create multi-user interactive websites. And all these sites I just listed and the examples I gave are really a testament to the fact that Drupal is not just a CMS, but a, that it is really a content management framework. Uh, because you can uh, take it in so many different directions uh, and create so many different sites. In the area where we are really strong is in the upper right corner, uh, 
uh, where we have lots of sites with a lot of interaction and typically uh, many uh, contributors. So how about you? How many of you have a Drupal site? Okay. Quite a few. So let's um, have a closer look at uh, the Drupal platform. Um, so, Drupal uses a LAMP stack. What this means is that you need some sort of uh, platform. You have hardware, can be any hardware really. And on top of the hardware, you need an operating system. We uh, can be Linux, Solaris, Windows, uh, and so on. And on top of the operating system, you need to run a database. Um, typically, most Drupal sites use uh, MySQL, MySQL, uh, but we also support Postgres, and there's people working on Oracle and DB2 uh, abstraction layers. And the database really makes up the uh, content layer. So that's where all the data and the content is actually stored. And uh, you also need a web server. <coughs> Typically, again, most people use Apache, but we also support Microsoft's uh, web server, or Lighty, or any other web server. And then you need, of course, PHP. It can be PHP 4 or PHP 5. Um, both work. And then on top of that, we actually have Drupal, which is indicated in blue. And Drupal itself consists out of three parts. You have the Drupal core, which is the base functionality and the building blocks. And on top of that, you add functionality, and the functionality is provided by modules. So the modules make a replication layer. And then on top of that, you have teams, and the teams define the look and feel of your site. So that's the presentation layer. So one of the questions I often get, especially because I'm also doing uh, lots of Java work for my day job, is why PHP and not Java? And the answer really is that PHP is made for the web, so it has lots of uh, useful shortcuts and uh, you know, convenient functions to write web applications with. And also because I think that uh, Sun failed to make Java accessible, um, especially many years ago. Um, you know, no matter how you look or where you look, PHP hosting is typically a lot cheaper than Java hosting, or at least it used to be. Uh, plus, it's, you know, for people who are new to the web, it's much easier to learn on a PHP than it is to, to learn Java. Of course, it also has drawbacks. Um, but I honestly believe that the web is built or is going to be built by uh, amateur, amateur <coughs> so, And I think that's uh, why PHP is so successful. Um, so say you want to build a company website, how would it work? Essentially, you would uh, just enable a set of modules. You would enable the static page module, so you can create static pages. Um, you might want to enable the file upload module, so you can upload files to your Drupal site. Uh, you might want to enable the contact module or the e-commerce module uh, to provide a contact form and to sell uh, things of your website. So you want to make a discussion on the site, you just enable a different set of modules. So in this case, for example, you would enable the forum module, the profile module, and the comment module. So you could have uh, discussions on your website, and so people, the users of your site, could, um, you know, they could uh, provide a profile, upload a picture of themselves, uh, you know, mention the, the URL of their website, and so forth. Now, if you want to create a company website that also has a discussion area, you just enable all the modules. Okay, so that's really how it works. You just pick it, you know, you just pick the modules you want, you enable them, and then um, you have to do some configuration tuning to get every, everything to work together. And the cool thing is that right now we have over a thousand uh, different modules you can download and install, so there's really a lot of functionality already provided by the Drupal community. So, if people want to create a complex website or a simple website, it usually goes, you know, you just, you typically spend a lot of time investigating all of these modules. Once you figure out which modules to use, you can actually set up your Drupal site in one or two days, and then, on top of that, you'll spend 
a couple more days or sometimes uh, longer to actually get the, the last 5% uh, in place as well. And that involves, for example, theming, customizing, you know, making it all fit uh, together. But in general, if you, want, if you have a customer, for example, and you want to do a prototype, it's really easy to do a quick prototype. And here is another example. Um, um, okay, so say we start with the story node type, which is provided by the story module, and a story is really a basic content type. It has a title and a body, it has an author and a couple of other things. So it's really a very basic type. And say you want to say you enable the event module, which is a module provided uh, in the contributions repository. Then all of a sudden you're able to associate dates with your story. So you can associate a start date and an end date with your story. And so you event enable that story. It also means that um, you're able to, um, to show or to provide an iPad feed or some other feed um, of all these stories which, which have been event enabled. Okay? So the event module um, also provides these kind of things. Now next, uh, say you want to enable the location module, then all of a sudden you're also able to associate uh, geolocation information with your uh, story. And you're able to show um, you're able to show where your story with the uh, with the date takes place on a map. Okay, so you have Google Map integration, for example, which allows you to visualize all of that. Now ne next, say you want to enable the sign-up module, then all of a sudden people are able to uh, register for your event. Okay, so they can say whether they want to attend or not. And lastly, for example, when you enable the e-commerce module, you're able to turn this into a, a conference site where people have to pay before they can register. Okay, so by enabling these modules and chaining them together, you can uh, build uh, powerful uh, websites. And as an example, the Fosman website itself is built in Drupal. Uh, they also have an iCloud feed and stuff like that. I don't, I haven't been involved with that, so I don't know whether they did it, whether they did it the right way or, or um, <laughs> um, I think they did. Okay, so in Drupal, almost every piece of content is what we call a node. So a node is really a base type from which all of, all the other content types are derived. A little bit like in object-oriented programming, where you have events, articles, reviews, they're all derived from uh, the base node type. And the node system, which deals with these nodes, provides abstraction. On the one hand, for the data, so every node has a number of common fields, like every piece of content in the system has an author, has a date, has an ID. But also, on every piece of content in the system, you want to perform a number of operations, okay? So, you want to publish content, you want to provide workflow and access control on that content. And the node system abstracts all of that. And then, given the node system, modules can extend the node system uh, in two ways. Um, so, either Modules can um, so either modules can provide new node types, which are the great uh, bars, I guess, uh, like forum topic, static page, and so on. So they basically extend the node type, and then or modules could uh, cross cut across all these different node types and add functionality on top of that. For example, the upload module um, can provide upload functionality and. and and uh, attach it to any of the content types. And then you can configure which node types are affected by that module. So you don't have to, uh, to use that. Other examples are trackback and email subscriptions, for example. So here's another example. Say the node module, as I explained, provides default functionality and default uh, fields, like a title, a body, and a timestamp. And you enable the recite module, for example, and all of a sudden you're able to associate uh, one or more ingredients to your content type. So it becomes a recite. 
And the rating module allows you to uh, score the, the recite. And then, for example, the comment module uh, allows people to add comments to uh, the recite. So that's really how it works. And we also have something called the CCK, which stands for the Content Construction Kit. Okay, so like I explained, modules extend um, the, note, the notes in, in, in Drupal. And the way we typically did, did that, or can still do, is by um, creating a module which involves programming PHP to extend the notes. Okay, and the CCK, or the Content Construction Kit, provides a user interface interface which allows you to uh, create new fields and associate these with uh, nodes. So this means you no longer have to be a programmer to create new content types in the system. Okay, so that's one of our most popular models <coughs> and we're slowly integrating this functionality in the Drupal core. And then even with the CCK you can still have uh, other modules uh, which add fields or functionality to nodes. Um, okay, so the node system is a central piece of functionality in Drupal, but we have lots of other building blocks, uh, which I can't explain uh, all in this presentation, but essentially we have a database abstraction layer, which allows you to write um, secure uh, uh, SQL queries. We have support for clean URLs, which allows you to score high in Google and other search engines. We have, for a couple of years now, we have full Unicode support. We have session handling, localization, which allows you to translate your user interface, uh, but also your contents. We have file handling, um, validation. We have permissions where you can um, uh, assign uh, roles to, to users, and then you assign uh, permissions to these user roles. We have support for user accounts, logging, and things like that. So we really try to make it easy for developers uh, to get started and to, to build web applications really quick. And here is just one example, which is the user management system, which is part of Drupal. Uh, we provide secure session management. It's also implemented in a way which uh, will make it easy to scale um, the session handling. Um, we have account registration, people can create accounts. Um, we have optional email verification, um, database uh, based sessions, a role based granular, granular permissions, uh, user profiles, uh, LDAP integration, and so on. So the list of features and functionality is really, really long. And it's, it's very difficult to, uh, well, it's, it's impossible to explain all of this in, in, one, in one session. But the point is that all of this functionality is typically available. So it's very easy to uh, mix. So next, uh, I want to provide a demo of uh, Drupal 5. Drupal 5 is the latest uh, Drupal release, so it's actually available. We released it um, one or two months ago. Uh, I think more like one month ago, and um, so far we got lots of uh, positive feedback about it. So. Um, so what, what what are the main changes in Drupal 5? Um, first of all, we, if you haven't, I mean, if if you were a user of Drupal 4 and you switched to Drupal 5, typically you would have, you know, you would have been surprised because we really made a lot of visual. Uh, changes. So we reorganized the administration pages. We, we added a web-based installer, uh, with also, which also does requirement checking. This was always typically one of the main uh, criticisms we got that Drupal was hard to install and use. So both these two items uh, should have taken care of a lot of these uh, complaints. We also integrated the JavaScript library. We chose uh, jQuery. Uh, as our JavaScript library because it's uh, really small and easy to use. We have a new core team. We also made lots of performance and bandwidth improvements. Um, we started integrating uh, support for custom content types, which is the CCK of the Content Construction Kit. Um, we improved the uh, module management and the block system and things like that. 
Let me see. Okay, so this is what you get after you install Drupal. Installing Drupal, we have we have installed shield now, uh, install system, and it takes about two or three steps and a couple of clicks, so it's really easy. And once you install Drupal, you end up on this page, and it essentially welcomes you, um, asks you to create the first user account, which I'll do now. And the first user account in Drupal is a little bit special. Um, it has user ID 1, and uh, it always has all the uh, access rights, so it's sort of a super user. I hope it works. So that's been taken care of. Because you are user one, you're all you're already given your password on the screen. Um, but for all other users, the password will be emailed. So I'll change the password just to be sure. So now I just changed the password. Um, then you can go back to the main page and read the other instructions. But essentially, now I'm logged in, you see there is a... I'm going to chair. Uh, you see there is an, uh, a new menu, which has an uh, administer link, which you can follow. And if you follow the administer link, uh, you end up uh, on the administration pages. Okay, so one of the things you'll notice quickly is um, there's a red bar, which usually means bad things happen. Uh, if you click the link, you'll see uh, a complete status report. So like I, I mentioned, the install also does requirement checking. And whenever you go to the administration <coughs> page, it will, it will recheck all of the requir requirements. So if someone downgraded PHP or upgraded some other service in the system, which might accident, accidentally break your system, uh, you'll be notified. And on top of that, it also uh, you know, gives you some other e information, like, uh, as you can see here, certain functionality of your website uh, needs GD, and GD isn't available, so it's complaining about that. Uh, normally, you would go over these and fix them one after another. But let's go back to the main administration page. Um, one of the things you see is that we try to uh, categorize all the functionality in different blocks. So we have content management, we have site building, we have site configuration, uh, we have user management, and logging. And um, under that we have lots of uh, yeah, other links which point to different, different kinds of functionality, uh, functionality. So that's what the administration page uh, looks like. Um, one of the things <coughs> you can do, for example, is you can uh, create new content. Uh, by default, there is only two content types enabled, which is story and page. Uh, stories, they go to the main page and allow you to create a blog or a slash dot style discussion or news website. So, for example, you can just type in the title and the body. Um, there's all kinds of uh, settings here. You can also install it as a menu, which I'll show you in a minute. You can control whether comments should be enabled or disabled. Um, you can uh, change the author, and it uses uh, an Ajax here. So normally you should do either completion, and it does. I can do that again. And then there's also publishing options. Uh, you can say whether it's pub published, whether it should be promoted to the front page, and whether you want to create a new revision of it, just like in the plug presentation. We have uh, revisioning. And if you submit it, it should go to the front page, like this. Um, say, for example, um, Say, for example, I want to use clean URLs, which are human readable. Uh, I need to enable a module for that. So I go to site building modules. And here you see a list of all the modules which are provided by core. And normally, if you have contributed modules, they'll, 
you'll have additional field sets uh, below that. Um, and to have clean URLs, we need a path module, so you can click it, enable it, um, mm -hmm. and then save the configuration. And that's all it takes to enable the module. Also in Drupal 5, which wasn't available in Drupal 4, uh, are module versions. We're now doing a dependency checking and also version checking to see whether one of the modules is outdated. Um, an example of the uh, dependency checking you can see here. So the, uh, it says that the comment module is required by the forum module. Um, anyway, I, let me see if I need to enable any other module. So I'll, I'll enable a couple more modules, like the contact module allows you to uh, create contact forms. The forum module I'll enable, which allows you to create uh, forums. And also enable the search module. Um, yeah, I'll start with this. So if I go back to the main page, I should now be able to um, can go edit. I should now be able to provide a clean URL for this post. And, um, <coughs> so I enabled the path module, and the path module extends this form. So there is a new field set, and I can use that to um, specify uh, URL. So if I submit this, and if I go to view, you actually see that the URL now became hello Frosdam. Um, this little part you can also remove using uh, your uh, HD access file. I, I don't have that enabled in this configuration, but normally it would look like this on a normal Drupal site. There's also modules which will auto-generate these, these paths for you based on the title and things like that. Um, I say I want to add this you know, say this would be a page on my site and I want to add it to the navigation menu. I could, again, I edit it, edit it again. Um, I go to the menu settings and here I need to provide a title for the menu item and the description is optional. And then you essentially can attach pages to any other page in the system. Okay, so you just have to select one parent and then the page will appear um, as a child of that. And there is, uh, by default, well, there are two uh, navigation menus, but you can create more. And the first one is this one, this block, and you can add menu items to that block. And the second uh, menu we have by default is this one, which is called the primary links, and you can also add uh, menu items to that. But you can also create additional blocks if you want to, or additional navigation schemes. So say we want to add it to the primary links, I select primary links as the parent item and submit. And as you can see, uh, the link now appeared uh, right there. Okay, what else can we show? Um, we also have blocks, which in the blog presentation was called portlets. Um, as you can see, I'm not sure it's really clear, but you, we have different areas. So essentially you have teams and the teams specify the areas where you can place blocks. Okay, so different teams can have different areas. And this particular team has a header, which you can see in the top, has a right sidebar, um, also has a left sidebar, uh, and has a content and a footer area. And, um, and here it provides a list of all the blocks. So for example, the navigation block, which is this menu here, is now positioned on the left sidebar, but I can easily move it to the side, right sidebar, like this. James will take effect immediately, as you can see. Uh, we can also add blocks. So either modules can provide blocks, or we can add blocks ourselves. So this is another block. this. So now the block becomes available in the, in, the, uh, in the list. I have to specify which regions, which region it goes in, say the left sidebar. I can also give it a weight, and the weight defines the order of the block. So the, the blocks with the highest <coughs> weight will sink lower and will become available at the bottom of the page. If I save this, the block will become available. Um, um, I think this was the block. 
And then there is also lots of settings uh, for each block which you can configure. Uh, you can um, yeah, you can describe the block uh, using multiple input formats. It can either be filtered HTML. You can even provide PHP code. So you can copy paste uh, snippets in it that actually execute or things or that access the database or that call a web service or whatever you want to. You can also specify um, who can see the block or we can, who can disable the block. You can also specify which roles have access to the block. Uh, and, uh, anonymous users or authenticated users. You can also specify in using various ways on which pages this block, uh, block should uh, show up. Okay, so that's how you add stories or pages and how you add blocks. Um, something else which might be interesting uh, is a user system. There's a separate uh, <coughs> menu item over here. Um, if you go to this page, you see an overview of all the users on the system. And Drupal sites can have thousands of users. Like, like I mentioned, the Drupal development <coughs> site has over 100,000 100, uh, users. And with these uh, controls, you can easily uh, mass operate them. So you can quickly do, do batch operations on all of them. On this site, there's only one user. But you can also add users to this interface, or you can ask users to create an account themselves. Um, and then I'll go back to user management. So I mentioned we have roles. So in this case, by default, there is only two roles. One role for the anonymous user and one role for the authenticated user. Okay, but say you have also administrators on your site. You simply add a role like this. The role has been added. And you can see uh, there's a new role available. And for each of these roles, you can edit the permissions. It gives you a matrix like this. So each of the modules expose uh, functionality which you can provide the uh, people in that role access to. For example, um, administrators might be allowed to administer blocks, um, should be able to access comments, should be able to administer comments, and so on. Okay, so if you, you go back to user management, um, you go to the users, you can easily, um, for example, you select the user, um, you can choose to add a role to the selected users like this, <coughs> and as you can see, uh, user please now is part of the administrator. Okay, there's also a different way to do that. If you edit the user trees, uh, trees you'll also have a, a list of the available roles like, like, like that. Um, let's see. The same with a contact form, really. It's really easy to create a contact form. Um, what you do is you add a category, um, for example, sales. which is just a list of email addresses. You can even provide an auto reply, hello, you receive your email, yada, 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 and then submit. And you have a contact form uh, created. So, so then all you need to do is uh, add the contact form to the menu. So then you go to menus. Um, and it's, on this page is a list of all the menus exposed by the modules. You can then choose to enable them or to, uh, to add them to a menu net or to navigation. For example, the contact form is still disabled, but you can enable it. Uh, when you enable it, again, you have to select the parent. So say you want to add it to the primary links as well. We you select that and we submit. Um, you have a contact form, if you click it, um, you'll be able to send uh, me, a, me a message. So, what 
what else can I show? Maybe the theme section. We have uh, okay. So by default, Drupal uses the, the idea, the same theme for the front end as for the back end. So if you Drupal five, you also can choose different themes for the back end. That's something a lot of people have requested before because they want a clean separation between the front end and the back end. And now uh, with this functionality, it's possible to do that. Uh, maybe I should first show you the, the various themes. So you can download and install any number of themes you want, and then uh, here, yeah, you can select the theme um, by default. Uh, Garland is enabled, but you can also check uh, enable, for example, Marvin. You can simply do it like this. You save the configuration, and all of a sudden your site looks different. Okay, so that's how it works. that provides uh, a little bit of an idea of how Drupal 5 works and what you can do with it. Um, <coughs> so I hope I was able to show you that uh, by using all these modules and all this functionality, it's quite easy to configure Drupal as essentially any kind of site you want. It can be a personal blog, like my, my site, could be a news aggregator, it could be a corporate website, which is fairly steady. It could be a discussion or community website, or really anything in between. Um, so I hope this relates back to the original title of the presentation. Um, and that Drupal can be the answer for many of the things uh, you want to do with Drupal. But again, that it doesn't necessarily is the best answer to all of these problems. Um, and another question a lot of people have is, will it be fast? Um, um, so Drupal has a page caching mechanism, which means we can uh, generate the page one, store it in a database or on the file system, and then when the page is requested again, we just serve you the cached version of the page. We can do that under certain situations where we don't have to uh, personalize the page too much. And when you enable page caching, uh, Drupal will be significant, significantly faster than uh, when it's not. Okay, so with the page caching enabled, on an old machine, you easily are able to get 250 uh, page. You're easily able to serve 250 uh, requests per second without too much uh, queuing. And if you compare it with a non-cached version, you can see it's the small bars on the yeah, on the left. It's it's a lot slower than. And this is a joke. <laughs> I, a warning up front. So I once set out to compare Drupal with Joomla, and that was Joomla 1.0, not the Joomla 1.5, which is supposed to be a lot faster. And with page caching enabled, Drupal turns out to be 400% faster, so four times as fast as Joomla. Now, if you take a Sunfire T2000, which is a state-of-the-art sun machine, um, which is known for its power consumption, so it has low power uh, uh, costs. Now, if you use Drupal over Joomla, you're able to save $6.33 a month in power consumption, which adds up to $75 a year. So by using Drupal, you help save the forest. Um, so will it, will it be fast? Yes. Will it scale? The answer is also yes. Um, scaling Drupal is essentially scaling a LAMP stack, which is well understood. It means you have to scale each of the layers in your stack. You have to scale Apache, you have to scale um, MySQL, and so forth. And Drupal uh, supports all of that, um, so it will scale. <coughs> now, if you want to get involved, there's many ways to get involved. We need people for all kinds of things. Um, the best way to get involved is to just check out Drupal.org. We have issue trackers where you can check um, all the pending issues and the pending tasks and uh, the things you want to uh, have help with. We also have groups on Drupal.org, which are uh, interest groups, either geographically or by topic. 
It's also a good way to tap into the community and to get involved with the people uh, that care about the specific uh, uh, topic. We also have, if you're living in Belgium, we have Drupal.be, which is the home of the uh, Belgian uh, user group, and we have uh, we have events. We meet every once in a while, and we uh, next month or even this month, we're going to organize a small workshop for people who want to. Uh, learn more about Drupal and you'll, you'll be able to attend that if you want to, so if, check it out at Drupal.be. There's also Google Summer of Code. Uh, the last two years we've always been uh, involved with the Google Summer of Code, which is a project by Google, um, which is meant to uh, sponsor students uh, to work on Drupal during the summer. And uh, Google just announced that they're going to organize a third Summer of Code and we're looking for people to submit uh, proposals for projects uh, and or to be a mentor for these students. And then we hope to get uh, some students as well this year. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask or make sure to check out the website. Question? Yeah. Is there any reason for a new installation that we should not install 5, that we should install 4.7? So the question is, is there any reason to install 4.7 instead of uh, Drupal 5? Um, so Drupal 5 is a lot easier to use. It will also be faster, typically, uh, than Drupal 4. Um, so I would always recommend to go with Drupal 5, except um, because Drupal 5 is only one month old, it means that not all of the contributed modules are properly updated to work with Drupal 5. Okay, so. Before you start your website, uh, make sure to check uh, on Drupal.org which modules are compliant with Drupal 5, and then make a decision based on that. It's the same problem as using Postgres instead of MySQL. Um, yes, so, so the, I think the question is, will all the modules work on both MySQL and Postgres? So the answer is unfortunately no. A Drupal core will work with Postgres because we uh, write NC as well. So we we, we provide like, we stick to the standards. But some uh, module maintainers um, sometimes use MySQL specific snippets or statements, and when they do that, the, the module won't work with uh, MySQL uh, with Postgres. Do you have an idea of the percentage? Not really. But it's something which we should do a better job at communicating as well. So it's not really clear, clear from the website which modules will work with, with Postgres and which ones will work uh, only with uh, MySQL, for example. <coughs> Question? Okay, so the question is do we have to install CCK? even though it's integrated in core? The answer to that question is, um, because the CCK is such a big part, I mean, it's a lot of code, and it's, we're essentially doing sort of a heart transplantation. Okay, we're taking a very core component out of Drupal, and we're replacing it with an improved version of the CCK. And we decided to do that in a number of steps. And Drupal 5, we completed, uh, depending on how you can, the first or the second step uh, to get the CCK in core. So right now you're able to create new content types with core, uh, which only have a title and a body. Okay, um, and in the next version, hopefully Drupal 6, you'll be able to uh, you'll have the complete CCK in core. And you'll also be able to add uh, additional fields uh, to these uh, content types. So right now, if you're using Drupal 5 and you want to use a CCK. You still need to install some additional modules which provide the missing functionality. Question? Uh, can you use on content level access rights? So, is a question can I explain how access rights work? No, um, uh, right now the, the access rights are defined by module. Yes. Um, if you want to build a community site where you provide access to specific content okay. to specific user level, Okay. Right now, it looks like it's problematic. So, there's two things here. There is access to functionality, and there's access to contents. And there's, these are two separate things. 
uh, in Google. Um, access to functionality is what I showed you with the user roles and the permissions. Ac access to content I didn't provide a demo for. Uh, but it is, it is supports, it's by the Google core. But the way to use it is by installing an additional, additional modules, one or more additional modules. And through these modules, you'll be able to express various things like allow people or allow people in this role to access content in this uh, category. Or allow people with this role to access content of this type. And because there are so many different workflows and scenarios, we haven't uh, put that in core yet. So core supports, um, core supports everything which is needed for these modules to be built on top of it. Okay, so there is, uh, there's just building blocks in core, but they're not exposed through a user interface. The way to do that is to install additional modules. Uh, but it's completely possible, and there's, I think there's up to 10 modules which allow you to um, configure um, access to content in various ways, depending on your situation and your, uh, your, your workflow. Question? Yes. Uh, does Drupal uh, or one of the modules provide a meta syntax to link to other stories or to do like uh, both face, underlines, and things like that? So is it you need to, to, put, to put the content in HTML already. So is the question, is there a module which allows you to link different First, to link different uh, to a, an existing story, mm -hmm. and also if there's a syntax, uh, like in Wiki, for example, to create sections to, to put yeah. more pages. So, for example, the CCK has a field which is called node rep, which allows you to link uh, different nodes and then sort of make it look like one uh, piece of content. And then the answer to your other question is. Um, everything in Drupal, all the content in Drupal is run through a number of filters. It could be one or more filters, and we call a group of filters we call an input format. Okay, so <coughs> I'll show you. So when you edit a piece of content, like in this case a body, there's often an input format a field set. And it allows you to select different uh, filters. For example, it could be filter HTML. And in this case, it will uh, replace web page addresses and email addresses and make it into links. It will strip evil HTML. Uh, and it will do a line breaks and paragraph tags. Okay? By, by default, in code, there's uh, three filters, but through modules you can add more. For example, you could add or install uh, a filter which provides wiki functionality or which provides uh, support for VB code or other uh, markup languages uh, used in other systems. There is also a module which allows you to use LaTeX uh, and do, uh, you know, describe mods um, and things like that. So it's possible to have uh, different uh, Yes. Can you repeat the question? Sorry. Can you explain a little bit how the site works? How it affects the content? Okay. So, multi site, there is a number of possible solutions. Um, one is to you can run multiple sites in a single code base, um, and then each of these applications uh, will have their own database. And so permissions are managed on a per database type. The other solution is where you have multiple sites which share a database or share certain tables within a database. You don't have to share all the tables. And then if you, for example, share the user table and the user roles table, you'll also be sharing your issues. But it's, it's a good question, but it's a technical and long answer.